Good morning, campers. <laughs> I'm Chris. I just want to thank you very much for joining me for this talk today about responsive images. Um, I know that this is at least one of two today. I'm going first, and Kevin Hoffman is going later, and he's going to be able to tear apart anything that I do wrong right now. So please take it easy on me. Um, so basically, I wanted to talk about today uh, kind of responsive images, the value of them, um, get into kind of just the kind of basics of responsive images, but then really take it a few steps further and just talk about how you can optimize those images to make them really, really uh, high performance, get your website in, in basically as good of a shape as possible um, for quick page load and, and uh, taking it as far as you can. So first of all, why optimize? Um, obviously, we know this is all about performance and the different impacts that performance have on your website, your conversion rates, your engagement of your users, and the uh, just all of the aspects of, of you wanting people to be on your website. Performance has a huge impact on that. So um, you know, first of all, just to quote Google, sites that load in five seconds versus 19 seconds observed 25% higher viewability and 70% longer average sessions, 35% lower bounce rate. So you're getting a whole lot of people, or a whole lot more people looking at your site, uh, looking at it for longer and not leaving your site uh, as quickly. Um, and then since the dawn of Web 2.0, uh, you know, quite some time ago, sites have gotten larger and larger as they've gotten more interactive. So um, yeah, part of that interactivity has been, you know, much more advanced JavaScript, uh, many more images and interactive images and different ways of, of engaging with those images. Um, and because of that, the page load has gotten larger. Um, for quite some time there, for a number of years, it was getting exponentially larger on a yearly basis. It was accelerating in how much bigger uh, images were, uh, or the overall size of the page load was getting. Um, and then it's kind of at this point still growing year by year, um, not quite as largely, but the, the end result is that websites keep getting larger, the page load of the assets keeps getting larger, and at some point, um, you know, you, you need to start to account for that. Alongside that same trajectory, more, pe more and more people have been using mobile devices to load the web page content that you have. Google now indexes mobile first, so that's indicative of the fact that they know that more of your traffic uh, on your website is coming from mobile devices now than it is from desktop computers. Uh, you know, obviously different websites have different statistics for that, but I think uh, it's, it's just kind of an important to keep in mind that most people are kind of on the go browsing uh, your website on their phone, maybe not the best internet connection, uh, maybe not the you know, super high horsepower uh, processor that you have in your computer, and for all those reasons, kind of optimization for those different platforms and those different devices is super key. If that's where people are viewing your website, then you need to make sure that you're providing the best possible experience for them on those devices. Uh, and a huge, huge part of that is that your page loads really, really fast. Um, to take it a little bit further, if you have an e-commerce yeah, e website, uh, it's super key to have that page load quickly again. Uh, when you're talking about conversion rates and people actually purchasing what you're trying to sell them, um, there's a huge, huge drop off uh, kind of right after the two and a half, three second mark where your conversion rates suffer drastically um, as you get past a certain point. Um, you know, on average, you could have up to kind of 2.4, uh, uh, sorry, uh, about a 2% conversion rate if your page loads as quickly as 2.4 seconds, and that really, really drops off to kind of about a half percent conversion rate or 25% of what you could have had uh, once your page gets to about the six second mark. So, you know, that's a huge, huge impact. That, that, could, meet, uh, that could make the difference if you're selling uh, you know, thousands of dollars of products you stand to make or lose thousands of dollars on a monthly basis uh, because of that. So it, it's really, I mean, for, from a content perspective, from a sales perspective, whatever you're trying to accomplish with your website, it's so, so paramount that people are able to engage with that content as quickly as they possibly can. Um, and so why do we go to images, I think is, is obviously the next question. Um, images, on average, compose about 64% of the average page's payload. So that's a huge, huge part of it. Obviously, images are big assets, um, and, and, and so optimizing them is, is really the low-hanging fruit. If you can optimize that part of your website, um, you're optimizing a huge you know, percentage of your website. About two-thirds of your website's payload is going to be those images. So it's an awesome place to focus. Um, 
and, and, and it's, it's low hanging fruit. It's, it's a great way to, uh, to, to, to kind of start and make your website as performant as it could possibly be. So kind of, and again, we're just kind of starting with kind of the baseline type things just because I think these things are important and it, I think it's worth considering. Before you even get into making your images responsive for your website, you really want to think about how you're sending those images to um, the people using your site in the first place. And kind of the three main file types that everybody's interacted with start with, you know, uh, JPEGs for things like photorealistic uh, pictures, pings for if you need transparency, or for kind of lower weight illustrations. So if it's an illustration with a limited number of, co of uh, colors, not photorealistic, great place to, to use pings also. And I think that's one thing that I've noticed. A lot of people think, okay, we'll always use lossy JPEG format for basically any image that doesn't need transparency. Um, a lot of times, if you actually you know, take a look at the file size, if you export a, a ping image that is something with relatively limited colors, relatively um, you know, uh, simple design, you'll oftentimes get a totally lossless picture that in fact weighs less than that JPEG. So again, if it's photorealistic or something like that, absolutely do JPEG, export at a reduced quality. But if you, um, you know, do have something that's a little bit more limited in colors, I'd say try exporting as a ping, see what happens. Um, and of course, then we have SVG, which um, are scalable vector graphics coming out of something like Adobe Illustrator. Those are for you know, pretty much the simplest of, of different types of images, low visual complexity, um, you know, still has transparency, and a huge benefit of that also is that they're infinitely scalable and they look perfect you know, all the time, as well as having a, a really low file size. So between those three, I mean, before you even start, you need to make sure that you're saving out your files in the correct format, you know, that fits uh, the occasion. Um, great starting point and, and something definitely worth considering because there's a lot of uh, kilobytes that you could save in just, in just considering which one is most appropriate. Um, so just to go into kind of like a basic responsive image setup, and this is not the way that we're gonna do this by the end of this uh, presentation, but this is kind of the, the foundational responsive images. Uh, with a few things worth considering, and really, it is inherently a part of you know where we're going to end up. Um, but just just to kind of break it down in a very simple way. So, first of all, we have a source set of different images. What that allows the browser to do is pick what uh, image is most appropriate for the situation, um, and use that image. So it only downs, downloads the most appropriate image for the viewport for the size of the image that's going to be showing up there. The second. Uh, rule here are the sizes, and that's where you're actually telling the browser the, uh, the browser the logic of what images to use. So in this case, it's saying, you know, if your viewport has a max width of 320 pixels, this image should be serving the 280 pixel version of the image, um, you know, which, which you're saying then in that situation is the most appropriate. Um, so those two things are kind of the, the instructions and the rules that a browser uses to make that determination. And as you resize your window or scale or tip your phone from portrait to landscape mode, um, those different rules come into effect and apply and it might load a different version of that image. So those are all good things. And what it really enables is a combination of the um, smallest file size and the highest image quality for a given size that the image is being displayed. And I think those two things are important to consider too. It's not only that we're making it fast, but we're making it so that it looks great on whatever device the person is using. Um, and really, if you can accomplish both of those with this type of solution, that's the ideal, the ideal situation. So already, um, obviously, that last slide, we're, we're considerably more complex than an image tag with a sing, single image in it. It's definitely a little bit more of a pain in the butt already. Um, that said, uh, there are kind of a couple different uh, pieces that can make this way easier. Um, so the first challenge again being kind of the multiple versions of the images. If you have to be able to serve multiple versions of an image, you have to have all of those versions to serve in the first place. And um, you know, if you have to save each one of those out of Photoshop or whatever photo editor you're using, that could be not very fun at all. Um, you could end up, instead of having to save out one image, end up having to save out 10 or however many you need for that set. So that's not fun. But we can optimi optimize those programmatically, either using WordPress's um, you know, built-in functionality, or we can use a task automation tool like Gulp or Grunt to do that. 
Uh, so you save out that one version of the image and then you have one of your systems automatically make all of the other versions for you. The second piece of it is, first of all, figuring out all those different breakpoints and then figuring out all the sizes that make sense for your site. And in that regard, what I would say is, first of all, the, the end result and the tool we're going to use here does a lot of that for you, which I think is really cool. Um, but the other thing is, when you think about your website, there's really only so many different sizes of images you're probably likely to use unless you have a super, super complex design on your site. Typically, if you're using a grid layout, you're going to have the images that take up half the screen in a lot of cases. You'll have images that take up the full screen or a quarter of the screen. But, you know, you're looking at maybe a set of, you know, five or six, I would say, on, on, a, on a moderately complex website that you're actually using. So you do need to figure out, you know, the size that it fits at that breakpoint and then also kind of accommodate for when things get fluid at kind of mobile sizes. Um, but it's really not that many and really you can kind of just start using those over and over again probably want to figure it out or at least consider it for every site. But, um, you know, at, at a certain point when you're implementing images in all of your different page templates, it um, becomes a big copy paste job, which really isn't that bad. So let's go into a little bit more why you really want to optimize. So this is Google Lighthouse. It is a tool now built into um, Google Chrome and it is awesome. If you haven't checked it out yet, I highly recommend it. Um, it's basically like all those website speed test websites kind of rolled into a single package that's right there in your browser, uh, analyzes your site right there, and gives you tons and tons of information about all the different things you could be doing to get really solid performance on your website. Nine times out of ten, if a website is, is particularly slow or, or even just not as fast as it could be, some of the main things that are going to come up are shown here. Um, first of all, serving images in next-gen formats. And that's basically serving things in WebP, which Chrome can use, Android browsers, um, or Chrome on Android phones can use. Um, and I think that's about it right now, but that's still a huge part of your, your target market. And it, it's really good to have a much smaller kind of image size for those people that can use it. So WebP is, uh, you know, a compression algorithm that uh, works for both JPEGs and PNGs and has a greater reduction in file size than both JPEG and PNG formats. So you want to make those available, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, the other piece is off-screen images. So when somebody loads a web page, they see what you have at the top of that web page. And they don't see what you have at the bottom of that web page. That's important. Because if, you, if you're not lazy loading your images, um, you're going to end up loading all of those images that they're not looking at. And that's going to be the whole weight of your web page and all the things that they don't even need yet happening all at once right at the beginning. That makes your website slow and that's not good. So lazy loading is a huge component of this as well. You really want to be able to serve people images when they're, um, when they need them and not before. Um, let's see. Properly sizing images, another thing that's very much helped by uh, using responsive images. Again, if you have, you know, an image that's twice as big that it needs to be loaded on the page, twice as much information, twice as much page load, that's not good. Um, you may never get to 100% perfect in every situation uh, without maybe using some kind of heavy kind of JavaScript library to kind of resize things on the fly, but you can get so, so close that it will, you know, have almost no, no additional weight or impact. So responsive images allows for all those different, um, all, that, all that type of sizing. Um, so again, that's under the Audits tab in uh, Google Lighthouse, which is built into Chrome. Super useful. Um, one thing I've noticed, if you are using Lighthouse, uh, you kind of get different results in current stable version of Chrome versus Chrome Canary. Um, I would say, I think they're working all the time. I think it's very much in development. Um, it's probably worth at least trying out both and kind of comparing the results that you get in kind of just regular Chrome and Chrome Canary. Um, and to kind of get a little bit further into why you want to optimize, um, the, some key uh, perspectives from Google are that there are kind of these different points at which people feel like they're engaging your site. And it's all about how their perspective of that kind of initial engagement with your site uh, really, really matters. So it's not just that your page loads. That's, you know, baseline, the page has loaded. It's a little bit more um, segmented than that. So the first point is the first meaningful paint, which is when there's something of value there on the screen. And that means that, you know, not everything might be loaded. You can't actually interact with it yet, but you do see it there. And that's important because you want people to see something, to see that you're doing something with them, um, you know, as, as quickly as possible. 
uh, then the time to first interactive. That's when somebody can actually start engaging with your website. And then consistently interactive is when sites ready, uh, the page is ready to go, they can start interacting, they can do a number of things on the page, um, and that's good. So Google has this thing called perceptual speed index, which, um, which, which gives you, you an idea of how people are perceiving the speed of your page. Um, and that's, that's a really important kind of metric to be taking a look at. So to get into the full depth of what I'm here to talk to you about today, um, basically it's that we want to do responsive images, but then we want to do a bunch of other stuff too to make it as fast as possible to meet all those metrics that you're going to see in Google Lighthouse um, and to even maybe take it a couple steps further. So it's responsive images, images served as both regular images for browsers that can't handle WebP and then also as WebP for browsers that can. Lazy loading your images so that you're only loading the content that people need when they need it and not loading everything at the very beginning of the page. Um, another really cool uh, tool which is SVG placeholders so that the first image that gets loaded on the page is in fact an SVG representation of the, um, of the actual image that you're going to use. And I'll go into a little bit more about that. And then setting up your site to leverage caching. So you, you want for uh, people when they're accessing your site, they've already accessed it, keep those resources local so that you don't have to send those across the network again. Makes it much faster, much speedier for them. Okay. So first of all, just to talk about the different ways that you can create those responsive images. Um, basically, a, a kind of easy first step is in your themes functions file. You can make use of WordPress's add image sizes um, function to create the different sizes that you might need. And here's an example of how I might lay that out in one of my theme files uh, for a specific website, taking into consideration the different sizes that those images are going to show up. And here you might want to consider both you know, regular standard definition screens as well as more retina displays which uh, present images at two times size, three times size, different sizes. I think you, you do kind of want to consider that if you have a million sources, it might be a little bit overkill. You want to kind of have the least number of different sizes that you can that really meets the breakpoints of your site and has a good looking and just about right sized image for each screen to again optimize both performance and um, the quality of the image. But you probably don't want a thousand of them either. I think I've had people critique me for using too many. Uh, this is kind of a standard set that I would use. Um, but to me, I feel like having, when, when you're talking about the difference in the size of images, you're talking about kilobytes or tens of kilobytes or sometimes hundreds of kilobytes of difference. Um, you do have, you know, that extra block of code that, and all those extra references in, in the code of your site. Um, but I think the savings that you have kind of warrants uh, somewhere in between there. So, you know, I might have, you know, eight or ten different sizes. Um, and I think that, that that's kind of a reasonable point right or wrong. <laughs> um, another way of going about this is if you're going to use a task automation tool like Gulp or Grunt. Um, I have used both and I think they're both great. From what I hear, all the cool kids are using Gulp um, and uh, it is a little bit more readable uh, so that's, you know, that's a, a nice benefit of it. Um, what that will do is you can just have kind of a watch task running in your larger Gulp task and Whenever you add an images or add an image to your source images folder, it will automatically run whatever processes you have set up to optimize that image. So, in a situation like this, this is just generating all of the different responsive images, uh, image sizes, um, and optimizing things like JPEGs, things, uh, and WebP images. So, you know, that's that's one possibility. Um, I'll hop out of the presentation in a little bit and actually take you through my whole kind of goal task that goes through these. It does a bunch of other things also. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, it's a pretty cool way to do it. So that's the uh, uh, example of the Gulp responsive plugin. Um, so then as far as WebP is concerned, and this is kind of a, there's, there's kind of two ways to go about this as well, either with a plugin because there are basically services that will generate WebP images for you. Um, or you could do it again as a gulp task using kind of libraries hosted on your own computer. Um, as the services go, these all seem really good. Um, I don't use them personally, uh, but I, this would definitely make it simpler uh, and you could just 
basically have this plugin running and use WordPress's own uh, image functionality and basically have all of your WebP images and optimized uh, and different sized responsive images. Um, so there's the EW web uh, image optimizer um, and that one's really good. I think it allows you, uh, it, it's set up so that you can either optimize images locally using your own server and different uh, libraries on your server to optimize the images or you can use their, um, their servers to do it and if you pay some amount they will, uh, they offer a couple additional options. Jetpack is another great one. Uh, Jetpack has uh, their image CDN which is 100% free, um, but they will, uh, they end up hosting the images on their own CDN, which you may or may not want. Depending upon how your server architecture is set up, um, you might want, you know, your own CDN kind of hosting those things to limit the number of outside calls the server is making to, um, you know, outside websites. So it kind of just depends. But good solution built into Jetpack. Um, and, and also Short Pixel and Optimus, again, it, they do either have an annual fee or, uh, you know, a, this kind of per image fee, which is like a fraction of a cent. Um, it could end up being like five bucks and really not costing you very much to use any of these services. And it does make it, you know, considerably simpler to just install a plugin and do something like that. Um, yeah, and basically, you know, just an example of uh, the EU image, opti image optimizer will basically convert to WebP for you, uh, save those files in your uploads directory next to where the, you know, different image sizes of the, of the, of the original file are. Um, so likewise, something you could do with a gulp task um, or a grunt task, uh, basically just generating different WebP options for you and there's something called gulp WebP that does that for you. So if you start thinking about kind of your gulp task as a series of processes that are running automatically, that are automatically optimizing your images for you. Um, it really just does a whole lot, and all you have to do once you've got it set up is just in your command line, you know, start your gulp task, and it's just watching for you as you're working on the site. Um, trying to think if I want to show you anything outside of this yet. <laughs> One sec. Um, okay, so the next uh, the next step is lazy loading your images. And this I really can't recommend enough. It's called lazy sizes. Um, let's say, yeah, by Alexander Farkas. Um, such an incredible and extendable library for lazy loading your images, as, just well, as well as just making this whole um, image optimization process way, way easier. It automates and does a whole lot of things for you, uh, that, you that means you don't have to think about it. So for instance, um, in addition to allowing you to serve either regular, you know, JPEGs, pings, or WebP, it also will automatically determine the correct image size for the place so that you don't have to set those responsive breakpoints. You do still have to set what size the browser should see that image as. Um, so for instance, when we were back at our previous example with the responsive images, um, we're still setting the width that's like the native width of the image right there. So you still do, do need to tell the browser that. But as far as this whole sizes section here, you don't need to do that because the plugin figures it out for you. Uh, so that's a really, really cool, um, you know, advantage right there. It also does a lot of other really nice things with, um, you can set it up for background images. There's a lot of extendability and a lot of kind of add-ons that, that make it super, super functional. So, um, so for lazy loading and just kind of the optimization of this whole process, um, I, I highly recommend it. The second piece you're gonna want with that is going to be um, the REST image polyfill. And that makes uh, these kind of responsive images, image formats, things like the picture element, things like determining whether WebP or, or will work or not, um, for older browsers, more compatible. Um, so between these two things, it's about 25K. Uh, when it's served via gzip over your, um, you know, over the server, that's minified down to about 5K. Pretty small, um, and again, with all the functionality and the potential, you know, hundreds of kilobytes of savings that it's giving you in loading those images on the page, I'd say it's super worth it. Um, you do need to load it in the header of your site, however, obviously because it affects the loading of, of content and display on your website, you don't want that to be happening after all the images are already there. So it does have to be in the head. Um, 
All right, so here is kind of a basic responsive images implementation using lazy sizes. Um, and this would be using uh, those images that were saved uh, using that um, WP add image sizes function um, from your uploads directory. So as you can see here, there is no more um, having to define the sizes. We are inside of a picture element. Um, and you'll see why we're inside of a picture element rather than just a regular source set um, in a little bit. But basically what this does is first loads your source image, which is going to be the smallest image that you've got, um, or the smallest version of image that you've got for that display. In this case, it's only 180 pixels wide. You're talking about an image that's maybe 5K, 6K, something like that on your website. So that's the first thing it's gonna load, which again, as far as that perceptual speed index with Google goes, you see a low quality image, it's not great, but it gives you some context. It gives you some idea of what's gonna show up there in that first you know, few milliseconds as the page is loading before whatever the exactly you know, appropriately sized image for that space is. Um, and then you're offering it this data source set in this case because again, the plugin is, is optimizing some of these things for you. So it uses a data source set attribute rather than a regular source set um, that is offering all the other sizes. And again, the browser then chooses which one is the right one. Uh, and it takes that image and it puts it in there. And then you have, again, an image that's optimized both for size and quality for the situation on the page. Um, with that plugin also, you do need to add a class, uh, lazy load, but that's all you need to do. If you have that class amongst your classes on the image, uh, the plugin knows to act on it and you're in good shape. Uh, also that data sizes auto um, attribute there, that is what is basically enabling you to not have to, um, to not have to specify the different breakpoints and sizes in your code here, thus keeping it a lot simpler, which is really nice. There are a lot of ways you can manage that with that in the plugin though, so again, it's worth exploring. For different situations, you might wanna not just have it automatically uh, determine the sizes. I don't know what those are, but maybe you have a reason. Um, so taking it a bit further, now we're getting into a situation where we have our images from both the regular versions, in this case pings, or that bottom section there, and WebP images being served so that you're providing options for browsers that both can handle WebP and thus are gonna be loading smaller file sizes, but also for browsers that can't, you're loading whatever that original format would be, in this case, uh, a PNG image. Um, still loading at the beginning there for your image source, um, the smallest version of that ping file. Um, but again, that's gonna be very low weight, low weight compared to, you know, trying to cover all browsers and loading something much larger. So this is kind of a, a, an example of, of, of those two pieces together. Again, you've got a big block of code here, but for the sake of performance um, and the sake of uh, really kind of reducing that image file size, um, it's a really, really functional as well. Um, you'll also notice as far as this layout goes, um, these are pulling from my theme template directory. This is how I typically set it up, but again, um, because I process everything using Gulp beforehand uh, as I'm building the site. Um, but then also apply, apply kind of optimization to the uploads directory as well. But you'll just see that this is um, pulling from, from my theme directory because they, they've already all been optimized, minified, um, and the different responsive breakpoints generated in my Gulp task as I was building the site. Um, so this is a really cool piece and uh, something that I'm kind of excited to share with you. So another really cool way of doing this and, and what we've been talking about with that initial image that loads, your, your source image uh, that shows up in the code. So far we've had a small PNG or JPEG or whatever the kind of baseline image that you need to show up in that first place showing up there. They're small but they could be smaller. Um, also in almost every situation, you're not going to have the user actually um, looking at that image for more than a split second when the actual image that's gonna show up there works. So you wanna minify that as much as possible. You wanna make that as, uh, as, as small as it could be because it's in between uh, what they're initially seeing and what you actually want them to see. So there's a really cool optimization uh, technique uh, using uh, SQIP or SQIP. I don't know, I don't know how you pronounce it. But uh, 
basically it takes your image, uh, your input image, makes a um, SVG image out of primitives that somehow resembles uh, that image that you have and then layers over that uh, a big Gaussian blur so that it's like if you were looking at the blurriest version of your image ever um, but in vector and um, and you know not, not jagged looking or anything like that, still very smooth looking but just like a blurry version of your image that weighs almost nothing, that's the first thing you load in its place instead. So um, and I can show you kind of what that looks like. Yeah, so, so just to show you kind of how this tool works, if you feed it, you know, a picture of a fox in a field, it's going to give you this like, just woke up in the morning, first, second you're cracking your eyes open, blurry pick view of that. And again, because it's not what you eventually want them looking at, um, it's, it's, what you, it's what you are just showing them in the meantime, and you're giving them that perception of things are showing up on the page. Um, to have a super, super small file that, that does that and to be able to automate that is super valuable. So I highly recommend looking into that. Um, again, it's something that you can run with uh, a gulp task uh, and kind of go through the, the whole, uh, just add it to your kind of uh, build workflow. Um, and, and that makes everything even smaller and even more optimized. Um, and as you can see here, you know, we've updated that instead of now your source image being a ping or JPEG, uh, it's that SVG instead. As far as WordPress plugins that do that, by the way, I haven't seen anything. Um, I'm not sure that there, there are any WordPress plugins that do this at this point. Um, maybe one of us will write one sometime soon. But, but, it, but it is cool, and again, you can do that with, uh, with Gold. Um, and the last point. Okay, so now we've made our images as small as, as, as you know, I think is, is really functionally possible at this point. The other thing, though, is you don't want to be sending people images. You don't want to be making them use the network if they don't need to. Um, so uh, some things you can throw in your HT access file that really help performance, allow the browsers to cache as much of the content as possible, are these types of headers. So first you want an expires header, which um, is the kind of legacy version of what browsers use to um, take a look at different file types and say, I'm going to store these in my local cache. So for older uh, browser types, you would use this very list of kind of uh, expires headers. Um, you can set the ex expiration time for as much as you want. It really depends kind of how often the content uh, shows up on your site. Um, and the more modern version of that is cache control headers, uh, again, which where you're setting kind of a max age, um, setting the type of cache, that's what the public or private piece is there. Um, the types of different servers that can cache it. So for instance, there you can specify, is your CDN caching it or only people's uh, individual computers? Um, so so that's, that's a great way to set that up as well. Um, another cool thing you would want to do in your HD access file or your, your comp file if you're like a server admin and you know what you're doing. I mean, these could all go in either place. Um, turn off e-tags, uh, which improves performance slightly. Uh, browsers have their own methodologies for uh, cache control. This says, no, don't listen to the browser one, listen to what I'm telling you here in this HT access file, uh, which makes things a little bit quicker as well. And enable compression. Uh, really no reason not to do that. You've probably seen this in you know, every website speed test you've ever looked at. It's like, oh, it's not compressed with gzip, do that. This is the thing. That's the code right there. Um, and you can choose, again, set kind of what types of files are going to be compressed. Um, and, and it makes everything obviously much, much smaller as it's transferred over the network, greatly improving speed. So a bunch of little bullet points. Basically, we have a solution that serves images that are best sized for the device, for the viewport that's using them, um, optimizing both performance and quality. Beyond that, we're serving images in next gen for browsers that can handle it in WebP, making those images even smaller. Um, and, and you know, obviously, that's positive. Lazy, lazy loading images for just in time, uh, reducing the initial uh, page load, which is huge, hugely important, um, and greatly improving the perceptual page speed. We're loading an extra small representative SVG image uh, first and reducing that perceptual space, uh, page speed even more. And finally, we're telling browsers to cache whatever content we think is valuable from the cache, which usually images is a great thing to use that for. 
um, so that repeat visitors aren't downloading um, a whole bunch of additional content that they've already downloaded before. Um, and I guess that's the methodology. You guys have any questions? Uh, pardon me? Yeah, so it's, um, so the question was, uh, how, how much would it help to have the SVG representations of the images? Like, what's the difference there? So it really just depends upon what your smallest version of the file would be if you didn't do it um, across every image file on your website. So if your 180 pixel version and the examples I gave of your ping was 15K or 20K and the uh, SVG version was three or 5K, which is, you know, I'd say kind of a reasonable differential in size there. And obviously that scales depending upon what size the image is. Um, you know, it could make it a decent difference. If it's 10K for image number one and it's 10K for image number two and you've got 50 images on the pages, on, on, on the page, you can end up saving a megabyte. Um, it really just depends kind of on, on the page layout and everything. But, you know, again, to me, I, feel, I just feel like wherever you can optimize, um, there's value there. And, and a 180 pixel image that's actually displayed on the page at, you know, 500 pixels wide or 800 pixels wide, it's gonna look terrible anyway. So kind of a, a scalable blur, blurry version is better than, you know, giant pixels that are all stretched out and stuff on the page, uh, you know, for that brief split second before the actual image loads. Yep. Cool. Awesome. Cool, yeah, I'll talk to you after. That's sweet. Cool. Any other questions? Yep. Are there any good solutions for Yes. So the question was, are there any good solutions for um, optimizing responsive CSS background images? Um, yes, that plugin, Lazy Sizes, does something for background images. I can't remember if you implement it in your HTML code or if it will actually work with your CSS file, but there is basically something that works in a very similar way to the kind of source set thing that we're looking at here as like an on-page image that works for background images as well. So I'd say, I mean, again, the documentation for that um, plugin is super uh, broad and, and really you know helpful, um, and they definitely have things for background images specifically. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, so WebP does not work for all browsers. Um, it only works for Google Chrome and Google Chrome on Android, as far as I know right now. Um, I'm sure there's a possibility that it will be adopted more broadly by other browsers. Um, but again, really the only, you know, you obviously have the references to those WebP images, but the way this is set up in this plugin, the browser's taking the file format that works with it, that's the best size for the situation. So. You're offering WebP. If the browser doesn't know what to do with WebP, just ignores those. The code is there, um, but it's pretty minimal compared to all the kilobytes you're saving by optimizing as much as you can. Cool. Um, any other questions? We're done. OK, cool. Uh, yeah, so if you want to download the PDF, it's right there. Um, or if you have more questions, feel free to email me. Be happy to share some code, whatever. Thank you.